which leads me to your great conversation with Coleman Hoggins. So, and some blogger tweeted that this entire interview was a single question and a single answer. And I would go the other way around. How public do you think the findings of IQ sh and race should be? So obviously we don't want any sensor, but do we need to teach them in high school biology classes? Should it be part of public discourse? Because as Coleman Hogan's pointed out in your conversations, there can be obvious negative consequences of having this public discourse. You can give young black students a very negative self image. Well, yeah, you can. And if you're talking about a practical question of should you teach it in the high schools, I would say no, for the same reason you shouldn't uh, teach particle physics in high school, that the high school curriculum in any ordinary high school is trying to impart basic knowledge and basic skills. And something like uh, differences in mean IQ between races is not something that falls into the category of one of those basic things you're trying to teach people. <clears throat> However, having said that, I think there is nothing that has been more damaging to the environment, the racial environment, than treating these differences as something scary. Um, <clears throat> you, you said earlier that some people discover they've been lied to. And, uh, and, and this sort of creates a, that radicalizes them. I think that does happen. <clears throat> and, and it would not happen if it were taken for granted that, hey, we have an empirical fact. But the empirical fact is you give test scores to people of different races and uh, they come out with different means. If that, were, if that kind of thing were just taken for granted, then it would be much easier to defuse it. And let me give you an example about a black kid who is told uh, that, that, uh, that his race has lower mean IQ uh, than white people. All right. Suppose we lived in a world where it was also considered okay to say in public, blacks are way better than whites at uh, uh, all sorts of sports. Uh, they are way overrepresented in all sorts of... Uh, of the arts, but suppose that we just talked about the ways in which different groups of people have these different profiles of abilities. And once you could do that, then you're saying to yourself, if you're a black child, which it's hard for me to you know, put myself in that place, but well, there are good things about the, the group to which I belong and there are bad things about the group to which I belong. Look. It's also wrong to think that we, any of us, judge our world in terms of what other people say about us. Now, I, my background, my, my ethnic heritage is Scots-Irish. And um, most of listeners in Israel probably will not be familiar with the Scots-Irish, but they are a particular group of Scots who were emigrated from Scotland to Ireland, were there for a couple of centuries and came to the United States. And I grew up, as I read history, the Scots-Irish had a reputation for being drunk and violent, okay? They also had a reputation for being great pioneers, you know, exploring the West and that. Well, so there's kind of antisocial, they're kind of violent, they drink too much, but they also explored the West. And that combination of things uh, was something I was always very proud of, of being Scots-Irish. And for heaven's sakes, that you as a Jew are familiar with all the ways in which the world wants to tell you and does, has told you in the past very terrible things about what Jews do, all right? And is the, again, I can't put myself in the place of a Jewish child, but it seems to me pretty obvious that Jews have not heard all those things and said, oh, we must be horrible people. <laughs> They've said instead, here's what I know to be true. And, and by the way, I'm sure Jews among themselves talk about and make jokes about uh, all sorts of characteristics 
that are they wouldn't make in, in polite conversation, just the way that whites make jokes about other whites and other white ethnic groups, just as blacks, when they are among themselves, will be candid about strengths and weaknesses. If we can do that within our own groups, isn't it healthy if we can, to some extent, try to do the same thing across groups, where we're kind of laughing at each other in some cases, admiring each other in other cases? I must tell you. I'll just, just, just add one more thing. That used to be fairly true in comedy, that in comedy, in American humor, you had brilliant black comedians, you had brilliant white comedians, and each of them would make jokes about the other, but in a, in a broader context where they were also making, making jokes about themselves. And that was much healthier. Uh, but now we have no safe zone. Uh, uh, I, I must tell you that my wife, when she discovered all the thing about intelligence, and if you have kids, you, you detect in a second that each child has a unique character, unique uh, feature, some kids are much more intelligent than the other. And if you don't incorporate intelligence as being partly genetics, part of the traits that you are born with, it's going to be very cruel because you ask like some, some of your kids to level up to the more, to the more intelligence kid, but it's, unpass- it's impossible. And if you incorporate the discussion of intelligence and say, listen, he is good at that, and he's good at that, and he's good at that. So it's much more, it is much health, he- healthier discussion because I'm not expected to live up to the expectation where I cannot be. Would uh, you agree? Look at, look at the, con- I think your, your point is extremely important that one of the best ways to think about racial differences is to think about your own children and the differences between them. But consider the contrast. If you have four children and uh, one of them is really, really smart and the other one is quite average, if you as a parent then say that you expect the, the child who is just average to get the same test scores, to get the same... Uh, accomplishments in university and so forth, as the smarter kid, most people would say you are being a very bad parent, that you are being cruel and unfeeling and and, uh, insensitive to it. But if you are an American social scientist or educator, and you say, you know, kids whose strength does not lie in academic pursuits, but it lies in being good electricians, uh, being good plumbers, being being good cabinet makers, that they should pursue the stuff that they're good in. We shouldn't expect them to be nuclear physicists. But if, if you say that with regard to children of different races, you are accused of being a racist. It is called the bigotry of low expectations. If you treated your own children the same way you treat children of different races, uh, you would be criticized harshly and for good reason. And by the way, my oldest son is like a genius. He's very, very intelligent. But we always say openly and discuss and say, listen, your sister, she's less intelligent than you, but she has grit. And this grit has a major factor in her life. Therefore, she moves faster because she can compensate with other attributes, other as a feature that she has. So it's a very open discussion in our family that, okay, you might have more IQ, but she has something else, which is not less important. Not not only does she have something else, she has something else that you can't do. On this channel, you will see the authors of these books and many more having great conversations with me. Please subscribe, hit the bell button, and be part of this great community. See you in the next video.